Um, well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd, I'd like to thank Emma and um, Helen and the other organizers for the kind of invitation. Um, and I'm honored to be here and have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, the way we view cancer um, and, and the approaches that we think could potentially make uh, a real difference in the lives of people. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of, of, of what I think uh, cancer is, um, and uh, uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about calorie restriction, ketogenic diets, and some new approaches that I think will be effective uh, in potentially uh, bringing or reining in the aggression uh, of, this, of this disease. So um, basically, uh, the, the disease was uh, fundamentally described by Otto Warburg uh, through his uh, lifelong research in Germany. And uh, basically, uh, uh, what the Warburg theory is, is that uh, cancers arise from damage to cellular respiration. And if energy through fermentation gradually compensates for the insufficient respiration, respiratory damage eventually becomes irreversible. And cancer cells continue to ferment lactate in the presence of oxygen, which has been referred to as aerobic glycolysis or aerobic fermentation of these different kinds of terms. Uh, and this has now been recognized as the Warburg effect. Um, and there's a great uh, research emphasis into trying to figure out uh, what is responsible for the Warburg effect. And actually, Warburg himself described that it is damage to the respiration. And more and more uh, papers are coming into the literature saying exactly that. So just briefly going over the um, most simplistic of energy metabolism, you heard a lot about that today in more detail. Um, you know, basically, most of our energy comes through oxidative phosphorylation, about 90%. Smaller amounts of energy are generated through a, a process called substrate-level phosphorylation in the cytoplasm and also in the TCA cycle through the succinyl-CoA synthase step. Now, what happens in cancer is that there is an insufficiency of respiration for many variety of things, and I'll discuss how this happens. But in order for the cell to remain functional and alive, the cell has to get energy from alternative sources, so fermentation processes uh, can compensate for the deficiency in respiration. And this fermentation happens through the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway in the cytoplasm, using glucose as a fuel, or can actually be, uh, glutamine can be fermented in the, in the mitochondria uh, through amino acid fermentation, especially under hypoxic conditions. So you can get anaplerotic effects of glutamine and energy effects of glutamine uh, under certain kinds of conditions. So, um, as Warburg said, cancer is a disease of respiration. So if you're going to look at uh, respiration, you need to look at the mitochondria. And we saw this diagram the other day. It's kind of a generic. Uh, uh, this is the bean-shaped orthodox model of the mitochondrion, electron micrograph. These stripes here that you can see, these are the cristae. They're the uh, elaborations of the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and they contain the proteins of the electron transport chain that we heard about today. And they're held in position by a very interesting phospholipid called cardiolipin. And cardiolipin actually controls the function of the proteins in the, in the electron transport chain. Now, here's a mitochondrion of glioblastoma multiforme, and you can see crystallysis. So the very structures that are needed to generate energy through respiration are themselves missing. And Pete Peterson at, at Johns Hopkins had done a, a, a remarkable review showing that all the different kinds of defects that you could find in cancer mitochondria, there are defects in the numbers, the structure, the function. There is no known tumor cell that has uh, a completely functional uh, respiration, and especially if you look at all the different ways you can measure respiration. Now, knowing that, uh, we, over the last several years, redefined cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease, a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease. And we addressed many of the outstanding issues associated with the disease, linking all of the uh, so-called cancer hallmarks of Hanahan and Weinberg into the con conception of a mitochondrial defect. So this is the oncogenic paradox, which is how is it possible that so many different things in the environment can cause cancer through a common mechanism? And if we look at those various things, we have carcinogens, everybody knows this, radiation, hypoxia, inflammation, rare inherited mutations like the BRCA1, the P53, there's a variety of others, RAS oncogenes, viruses, and age. Just getting older puts you at a higher risk for cancer. 
Now, Orberg said there are many secondary causes of cancer, but there is only one primary cause, and that's insufficiency of respiration. And every one of these things, including the inherited mutations, damage the respiration in some way, leading to a dysfunction. So oxidative phosphorylation begins to fall off, whereas substrate level phosphorylation in the fer fer fermentation processes compensates. Now, how does this happen? The, the mitochondria signal the nucleus in a very interesting extranuclear epigenetic way for the nucleus to turn on those genes that are going to allow the upregulation of the pathways involved in fermentation. Those genes happen to be oncogenes. So the oncogenes are simply uh, 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 responding to the uh, abnormal energy metabolism that you have, and you get this upregulation, the transcription factors. But what happens is, is that you have this progressed state where the, the situation doesn't change, either in the cells and uh, the microenvironment is also participatory in this continual escalation of problems. Now what happens is that the radicals that are produced in the mitochondria uh, destabilize the nuclear genome. So we get multiple numbers of point mutations, different uh, chromosomal abnormalities. All of the things that we hear about in cancer are secondary downstream effects of damage to respiration. And I'll have evidence, I'll show you what I mean. Now, now the Warburg effect is simply the compensatory. Now what happens here is the cells, once they, their respiration is defective, they enter into their per, uh, default state, which is, which is unbridled proliferation. All of the cells, all of the organisms that existed on the planet before oxygen came into the environment were, were proliferated, they were fermenters, and they had unbridled proliferation. So what we're seeing is simply that the hallmarks are the consequence of destabilized respiration and the return to the default state, which is unbridled proliferation. You know, sustained angiogenesis is, is, is linked to the oncogenes and the, and the HIF-1 alpha, which has to be uh, on. Uh, the the mitochondria play a very powerful role in regulating cell death. But if they're dysfunctional, they escape the apoptotic mechanism and they go on to survive. And I'm not going to have time to talk about what the really key issue here, which is metastasis, which involves a fusion of myeloid cells with neoplastic stem cells, and you can get this highly metastatic situation. So what I have essentially said to you is that the disease is a mitochondrial metabolic disease with, with a lot of uh, uh, things uh, in addition to that. But what about the nuclear genome? All right, so what happens is if you take the nucleus out of the tumor cell and put it into a, nor a cell that has normal mitochondria, all of the tumor genes are suppressed and the, tumor the cells do not become tumorigenic, right? You can get beautiful regulated uh, growth. You can clone a mouse from a nucleus of a tumor cell, frogs. You can do all this. Speaking to the fact that these point mutations and these kinds of things are not causing cancer, they're the effects of cancer. Now, what they will do, they'll abort development, so you can only go so far in development. So this is a, a very different kind of a concept of what, we, uh, what we've been uh, 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 led to believe. So knowing that, so you can't really, in my mind anyway, you can't really attack a disease if, you've, if, you, if you don't have a, a clear understanding of what you think that disease is. So if all cancers, or most cancers, I should say, are a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease, what kind of therapies could we now envision that might help us uh, manage the disease? And calorie restriction, of course, is a really powerful metabolic cancer intervention. It involves a total dietary restriction, differs from starvation, maintains minerals, adequate levels of mineral nutrients, enhances mitochondrial bioenergenesis, and end oxidative phosphorylation. And this is important because John the other day mentioned, you know, humans are not rats and vice versa. And, and the key thing here is that we know one of the major differences is basal metabolic rate. Okay, the basal metabolic rate of human is about eightfold lower than that of the mouse uh, and about sevenfold lower than that of the rat. And this plays a huge role in how, in how these things uh, develop. Now, when you calorie restrict, everybody knows glucose goes down, insulin goes down, glucagon goes up, hydro, uh, fatty acids are mobilized at a, at a fat stores, go to the liver, they form water-soluble beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone is an enzymatic uh, by This is an evolutionary conserved uh, process that we, we go through, and we've seen a number of papers here at the meeting. Um, now, when we look at this and say, how, are we gonna, how can we use calorie restriction? Uh, to manage the, the, the tumor. And I've just drawn this diagram. So if we look under, here's the bloodstream, the capillary, and here's the tumor cell. Glucose comes in through the transporters, metabolized to pyruvate. Under normal, healthy conditions, the pyruvate would enter the mitochondria, be fully oxidized to give us energy through oxidative phosphorylation. But because the mitochondria are either, either defective in number, structure, function, or some like, something like this in, in the cancer cells, pyruvate is reduced to lactate. Lactate is excreted outside the cell 
creating an environment of, 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 of hypoxia and a wound, a wound environment that leads to the infiltration of all kinds of cells into the, into the system, uh, into the microenvironment, and the lactate can also go back into the bloodstream and goes to the liver, be converted back into glucose through the Cori cycle, and, it's, and it can come right back into the tumor in the form of glucose. So we lower glucose, beta-hydroxybutyrate now becomes the alternative fuel, it goes into the mitochondria of those cells that have mitochondria, but it goes through a series of, pro of metabolic steps to get down to acetyl-CoA. And we know from our work and many others that there are some defects in these pathways in the mitochondria of tumor cells, so you, don't ha you can't metabolize this very well. And even if you can, the mitochondria are often uncoupled or few in number, and it becomes a very, un a a very poor fuel uh, for tumor cells. So what we essentially are doing is we're marginalizing. We're, 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 we're for this fuel can be used by all the normal cells, but, and the, the prime, uh, a prime fuel, glucose, is being restricted, so we're metabolically marginalizing the tumor cells, and this will reduce their growth and inflammation in the environment. Now, this is a diagram we often use just to give you a highlight of, of what a 40% calorie restriction can do to a mouse with a, with a uh, uh, this is a uh, astrocytoma um, from, a, from a neural stem cell. And, and you can see there's a marked reduction, in the, this is ad libitum, unrestricted feeding. This is a calorie restriction, 40% for 14 days. You can see a big effect. We and others have shown that calorie restriction is anti-angiogenic, anti-inflammatory, and pro-apatotic. Okay, calorie restriction will lower insulin-like growth factor one. It'll downregulate uh, VEGF, uh, PI3AKT signaling pathway down to VEGF, lowers all that stuff. Uh, anti-inflammatory, we and others have shown that calorie restriction lowers inflammation by uh, targeting NF-kappa uh, NF B um, uh, and, and those regulatory pathways. And it's also pro-apatotic, which is very, very important when you want to kill cancer cells. You want to kill cancer cells with a non-inflammatory mechanism, which is apoptosis, as opposed to necrosis. So a lot of chemotherapies and things cause necrotic death, which leads to inflammation. We don't want that. Now, uh, we have a new model of gl human glioblastoma in the VM mouse, and I just briefly mentioned that these cells, when placed into these VM3 cells, is a natural uh, a model of human glioblastoma. You put them into the brain, and they, and they d invade right through the brain. Uh, it's impossible to surgically resect something like this because the tumor cells are well in advance. They move from one hemisphere of the brain to the other hemisphere of the brain. But when you put them on calorie restriction, you can see it. You can get a sharp, smaller, it's, it's much less diffuse and it's more demarcated and you can see cells that are reduced from moving from one side of the brain to the other. Now, the problem with calorie restriction, it's wonderful and great to talk about calorie restriction, especially on a full stomach. Everybody likes to talk about it. When you haven't eaten anything for a week, you'd be surprised what kind of an attitude you, you have. Then, the, and you have cancer patients that are already suffering from their disease, right? They have anxiety, they're all uh, upset about things, and now you're gonna tell the guy he has to take a water-only fast for three or four weeks? I mean, what is, this doesn't work, okay? So we, the ketogenic diet, we all know, I mean, this is, a, it, this is a, a substitute for calorie restriction. It does, it produces many of the same biochemical uh, situation. Now, this is a generic ketogenic diet. I, uh, you know, we all know it's low in carb, high in fat, moderate and low moderate protein, high uh, amount of energy per gram of food, and it's uh, got a four to one fat to protein carb ratio over the. I want to point out here that the ketogenic diet is most effective when consumed in restricted amounts for managing cancer, and I'll present data to support that. Not that it can't, uh, not, not that it can't work if you if you if you eat a lot of it, but it works much much better when it's restricted, and because. We, we have shown in mice that you can get dyslipidemia and you can get insulin insensitivity, which all provoke the growth of the tumor. So it's best to restrict and prevent that. I also want to say, uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, best ketogenic diets are from natural ingredients. Um, uh, and, I, and we don't talk much about the composition of the ketogenic diet. These ketogenic diets are not all the same. Some work much better than others, and we're not really sure why that's the case. But just to give you a quick brief, brief overview, here's a mouse tumor and a human tumor grown in vivo. And here's the ketogenic diet unrestricted. Here's a standard diet, ketogenic diet unrestricted for both the, the mouse and the humor. And you can see it's not reducing tumor, but it is when you restrict. And also when you look at the blood sugar, even though this is a, almost a zero carb diet, blood sugar stay high, it's dyslipidemia, it's insulin insensitivity. The gl glucose goes down when restricted. Ketones go high when you restrict, higher. This is important because uh, Angela Poff and Dom and, and I, we, we showed that ketones can be toxic. A new paper just came out right, recently showing that beta-hydroxybutyrate is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. And there's a lot of pharma, uh, cancer drugs on the market that are histone deacetylase inhibitors that cause toxicity. If beta-hydroxybutyrate can kill tumor cells by that mechanism, why would we want to use toxic drugs? And then, now this is an idealized <coughs> situation where we feel that when you initiate the diet, 
glucose is lowered, ketones are elevated, and you're trying to get this where ketones now become a major fuel over glucose. And this is the idea, I'm gonna show you the real world when you try to do this on a person. Hey, this is always wonderful to, to draw these little diagrams, but when you put it into practice, you find out how difficult it actually, it actually becomes. Um, so, <clears throat> what about patients? Well, does it work in patients? The first patient, well, the first paper was by Lyndon Dembling. She rescued two little girls that were, uh, had uh, progressive tumors that were unresponsive to standard of care. One, one child lived quite, uh, I think, a couple of years. The other child lived so long they were lost to follow-up. So we never really found out what I spoke to Linda directly about this. Uh, we published the second paper, and of course you heard from Raffaella that uh, he showed you this already on, on Julio's mother. Um, his father actually passed away from a GBM three years earlier. Can you believe something like this? We've never heard of anything like this. Anyway, he showed you this uh, multicentric uh, um, uh, GBM. Uh, now, what, right after surgery, this person went into a three-day water-only fast, segued into a very highly restricted ketogenic diet. And we were able to, um, as, as uh, Raffaele and, and Angela have shown, that um, get, we have this um, reduction in glucose and elevation in, in ketones. And then we have this, now this is called radiological resolution. Very rarely do you see this with standard of care. Not that it cannot happen, but it's extremely rare that you would have no evidence of the tumor. This is called radiological resolution. Doesn't mean cure, right? Because what happened is this person, we had two more of these kinds of images over a period of months. Every, everyone thought this tumor was managed completely. The person was very healthy, swimming in the Mediterranean, doing all kinds of things and then gets off the diet, and 10 weeks later, the tumor rages back. So there are tumor cells here that, that, that the imaging can't pick up, okay? Rather than going back on the ketogenic diet, the family chose to go on Avastin. I recommended against Avastin because I had seen the data showing that Avastin selects for cells that can live in hypoxic environments, and they spread throughout the whole brain, and you can't... So what Avastin does is it gives you a radiological image that makes you look good, but there's no increase in overall survival. So I, I think this is not a very good drug to use. Unfortunately, she used the drug and did not survive. Not to say that she would have survived if she hadn't done this, but we just don't know. Now, this is a, a recent paper coming out of Johannes Rieger's lab in Germany. And what he concluded, basically, is that diet is safe but, uh, but doesn't have any therapeutic benefit. But, you know, you say, well, what happened? Well, look, at he didn't, he didn't uh, the glucose is the same. The diet doesn't work. I mean, I did the mouse study. I showed it. It doesn't work. He did the same thing in the human. It doesn't work. So he, but to the credit of the authors, they, both, they all mentioned that maybe we should have restricted the diet. It probably would have worked. I mean, I think so. And I'll show you how. Now, the, the, the issue here, of course, is, you know, what we're dealing with here is a problem, a major problem. And the problem, in my view, is the standard of care itself. So I, we went back and we said, what is the standard of care? What, what's going on here? Um, uh, how do they treat brain tumors? Okay, surgical resection, resection uh, uh, radiation therapy, and temozolomide therapy. And, and that's basically the standard of care for GBM. So we published this little diagram in Lancet Oncology showing that when you irradiate the brain, uh, you kill neurons necrotically, the neurons release glutamate from their, uh, uh, from their stores, and glutamine. So what happens is glutamate is an excitotoxic neurotransmitter. It has to be regulated very carefully. In the brain, the glutamate-glutamine cycle is under very tight regulation to provide neural function. Okay, so you're releasing glutamine in large amounts from the radiation and the chemo, and then this is creating necrotic damage, and the tumors are sucking in this glutamine for anaplerotic and growth uh, uh, energy purposes. Okay, so you're giving a lot of fuels that this tumor will use and creating a very necrotic and, 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 uh, environment. And then to reduce some of the edema and inflammation, high-dose dexamethasone is given, which raises to make hyperglycemia. So essentially what the standard of care is doing is providing the two key fuels for the fermentation of the cells, these two fuels. And then also we now know from more recent papers that the human uh, cytomegalovirus infects the tumor cells of GBM, and these viruses facilitate, they act like superchargers to use glucose and glutamine in the tumor cells. So what we have essentially done is created the perfect storm of adverse effects for the survival and recurrence and continued growth of, of, these, of these cells. I mean, let's, this is the survival curve from uh, the, the, the Stoop, uh, who, who, devi who de developed the standard of care which is currently used in all major medical centers throughout the civilized world. There's very little variation in the standard of care wherever you go. It's written in granite. It's so written in granite that it cannot be ever, ever changed. Now, look at this. Here's, here's the red is, the, is, the, is the, the people who got radiotherapy. The blue uh, got uh, combined radiotherapy with temozolomide. Not a single survivor from the individuals that were radiated from this. 
Now, this was a, I was at the meeting when they, when they announced the temozolomide, it's an oral chemotherapy al alkylating agent, and everybody was so excited. This was the single greatest advance in brain tumor research in, in 60 years, the introduction of oral temozolomide into the patient population. So a paper just came out from Johnson at, at UCSF, temozolomide increases driver mutations by tenfold in the tumor tissue. And I said to myself, well, wait a minute now. Don't they, these driver mutations, aren't they, what do they drive? They drive progression. Okay, why are these people living longer if they have all these extra driver mutations? You, you say, well, how does that, how does that work? So I, I, so I went back and I, we just published a paper in Cancer Letters, and we said, what are the adverse effects of temozolomide? It's, it's fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, all right, to a lot of patients. Do you think, these are all indirect calorie restrictions. Do you think this little thing is, might be calorie restriction that's responsible for it? Because there certainly can't be some genetic mechanism where they have driver mutation increase. Think about that for a minute. Now, I employed Adrian Scheck and what she's trying to do. She's trying to combine ketogenic diets with radiation. And I'm very, I'm hopeful that she's going to be able to show that we can move this curve a little bit further. And this is what we have the, to look forward to. So um, and I want to share with you now another case report that's not yet published, but this is a person that we, uh, uh, myself and some oncologists have been following. Uh, an individual, a woman, uh, 56 years old at the time of gait disturbance. Uh, they were treated for all kinds of, of uh, she was treated for all kinds of in, in things, uh, you know, swimming lessons and all this, thinking it was something outside the brain. Then finally there was a diagnosis, inoperable diffuse infiltrative brainstem glioma. Um, and that was in 11, so she's had the symptoms since 09. Uh, she initiated a natural ketogenic diet, also supplemented metformin, DCA, and curcumin. She had to stop DCA after a while because of the peripheral neuropathy issue that we heard about earlier. So she's basically on, on these two, maybe now a little bit of oxygen, but we're not, we're still uh, pending. Then she went to these, uh, every, every major medical center, five major medical centers, all recommending chemo and radiation. She refused everything. So this is a person who has had no surgery, no chemo, no radiation, just ketogenic diet. That she's still going, the tumor grows, but it grows very, very slowly. Now, here's the reality of the situation. Blood sugar goes down, ketones go down. Now, she was very uh, hesitant at first, and then he, here's what the real picture looks like in a single, so when you talk about clinical trials, when all these people are gonna do all this kind of stuff, th there's an enormous amount of data that you need to be involved with just from one person. So each one of these is the mean of, of 30 or more uh, measurements using a medicine's glucose meter, ketone meter, and these are the averages of the month. So we have her over, over two years now uh, monitoring. She's over five years after the, the, uh, the symptom onset. Now here she was losing so much weight. I mean, this is a weight loss diet. We know this. In fact, Eric mentioned the other day, sometimes you have to get off the diet just to get back. So we're trying to, she's getting off the diet a little bit. You can see her numbers are getting screwed up there, but she's going back on it again. But you know, she was at about 45 to 46 uh, kilos, and, but she was doing very well. She was very healthy. She drove me around Nice last spring. I mean, I was, she was quite good at driving through the French you know, villages and things. So, um, but, but in any event, what the anxiety was, there was tremendous anxiety about, oh, my sugar's high today, my ketones are low, all this kind of stuff. So what we did is we developed the glucose ketone index, a simple tool to help manage cancer. What it is is the ratio of glucose in millimolar, ketone in millimolar, you get the, 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 the index. Therapeutic efficacy is considered best with the index approaching 1.0. Now, what my student and I did, we patented a formula that can be added to the glucose ketone meters in, a, in the form of a chip that you can simply push the button and get the index. As soon as you measure glucose and ketones, you push the button, you get a single number. This makes life uh, a lot easier. And, this, and we went back and recalculated her data. And you can see that this is the period, the tumor is growing extremely slowly. And here she's getting off the diet a little bit. Go, you can see going back on again. But, but you, get this, you get this, now this makes patients a lot more comfortable. They're not freaking out all the time by having all these weird values going up and down. So it's a much more uh, 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 stable way. So we went back and looked at um, the, uh, the Julio's mother. And here her index was 37.5 at the beginning, 1.4 during radiological resolution. We went back and looked at our mice, and you can see he was at 15.2, and then the tumor was small at 3.7. And then uh, we, we've now correlated that the index, the lower the index, it seems to be associated, I think it will work with epilepsy, any of the, anything where you use a ketogenic diet where glucose and ketones are essential for the therapeutic management, we're gonna get uh, this kind of thing. Now, I, I don't think we're gonna cure cancer by using a ketogenic diet. Now, there's some people that um, think that, oh, we're gonna cure cancer using a ketogenic diet. Now, I think, you know, some people do really well. I don't think it's gonna be the, the be-all to end-all. It'll help. 
Now we're going to use the press pulse con uh, paradigm. This is a concept from ecology that uh, for mass extinction of organisms, you, you take a, a, a press and a pulse as a chronic situation combined with, a, with an acute situation for the mass extinction. Every cell in the tumor has mutations. Uh, every, those mutations are, will be our allies because every, as we change the meta metabolic environment of the whole organism, some tumor cells will survive under one condition, some on another condition, but we, we think no tumor cell will be able to survive on all of the conditions that non-toxic drugs and hyperbaric oxygen, and this is only the beginning. There's so many other things. Here's an example of pressed pulse with 2-deoxyglucose in diet. So diet works, glucose had very little effect, put the two together, you got a pressed pulse synergy. Same with what we heard from Raphael and Dom, uh, with Angela uh, Boff and Dom D'Agostino. Our metastatic model, they, the cells metastasize throughout, throughout the, and we can follow them by bioluminescence imaging. Here's hyperbaric oxygen by itself, ketogenic diet by itself, with a mildly restricted, and together they get synergy, pressed pulse. And here's a, an example uh, from our own lab, unpublished, using a, the ketogen, ketogenic diet, 18% body weight reduction. And uh, one of the 25% of cancer patients die from metastasis from some organ to the brain and we're able to stop or re significantly reduce uh, metastasis from the, from the brain. We have to cover the body because it's so bright into the brain. So uh, preclinical and case report studies indicate that the restricted diet can be effective non-toxic me metabolic therapy, and we think the effects can be uh, enhanced when we combine drugs with oxygen in this press pulse scenario. Now I just wanted to uh, briefly, with the couple of minutes I have left, is um, uh, it works really well on dogs, okay? So this is a um, large mast cell tumor uh, on the nose. Here's the nose uh, of, of the dog. Now the woman, the woman uh, read my, you looked at my YouTube videos and read some of our papers, and she said uh, she went to the, the vet. The vet says uh, surgery, radiation, chemo. You know what else is new? Uh, the dog will get very sick and may last only seven months. He said to her because this is a very deadly kind of a, a tumor. So uh, she does, she goes out and gets the chicken, uh, raw chicken with the bone still in it, medium chain triglyceride oil, raw eggs, and cuts the calories by 40%. The dog lost four, uh, five pounds. And uh, th this is just in a couple of months. You see where the tumor used to be. And now this is more recent. The dog is fine, he's running around doing great. So uh, just from simply changing the diet, you know, no, no drugs, nothing. So um, I also would like to bring your attention to our new thematic review series that I organized for the Journal of Lipid Research. Um, and this uh, uh, emerging evidence for the therapeutic role of ketone bodies in neurological and neurodegenerative diseases. And, 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 much, and we have met several com contributors here, John Rowe, uh, Adrian Sheck, uh, Susan Massimo, and uh, uh, we had Megumi Prince. And we have a lot of discussion and, and it brings together a lot of the things uh, that we've been speaking about uh, at these meetings and, and, and outlining the mechanisms uh, by which this would uh, be effective. So I'd just like to thank my colleagues, uh, many of them from different universities, students and physicians and, and what have you. Uh, and I, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions that you might have. Mm -hmm.